Expirates, a global network for women in trade, and also co-founder of the Trade Policy Research Forum. And you're all very, very welcome. Thanks for joining. It's a pleasure and it's an honor to have you. A few years ago, there was a real hype in the blockchain technology. It was said to be helpful to set up digital databases, to follow every part of the trade transaction journey in a transparent and efficient way, accessible, and it was a method that could not be tampered with. Blockchain technology would allow to monitor goods from producer to consumers. And a lot of big and small companies expressed a lot of interest and they started different pilot projects. Potentially, it can have a great impact, but the hype maybe is a little bit gone. Uh, we will ask Hannah and others to help us to understand this. Uh, but Hannah, first, from a policy perspective, what, how is digital trade different from other types of trade? What do we need to think about as traders or as people interested in trade? That is uh, an excellent question to start us off with, Cecilia. Um, not just what is special about digital trade, uh, but I think what it is. Um, so with the definition that you were, starting from the definition that you were talking about, which is the OECD definition, sort of tentative typology um, that Javier Lopez Gonzalez came up with in 2017. Um, so I've only been in the digital trade space since 2015-16. So I'm sort of late to the party. So this was during TTIP, right? When you were discussing, when you were um, working on the TTIP uh, with President Obama. Uh, and um, because the Americans have been looking at trade flows um, or data flows as a trade issue since back in the Clinton administration. But to the EU, that was new uh, with so many other things that was new in the TTIP. Uh, but so in those six years, five, six years since then, six, seven, oh, time flies. Um, for every day that passes, I find that term digital trade to be <laughs> more confusing and more uh, misleading as we go. So first talking about the digital part, right? So the digital trade, specifying digital trade means that there is something else, right? Otherwise we would call it trade, but calling it digital trade would mean that there was an analog trade or a non-digital trade, which is, you know, very hard to find uh, as every day passes. It's harder to define what digital trade is, but it's, it's getting easy to define what non-digital trade is uh, because that would be pretty much nothing at this point, right? Um, so that's the part, that's the first part. And then the, se the second part of the term, which is trade, it, that's also becoming sort of meaningless. Uh, compared to how we regularly use the word, right? Because when we trade, technically we barter, uh, but in more uh, modern times, what we do is we pay for a good or service um, that we would like to buy. And that's fine as long as we talk about digitization. So digitization is when we take the analog and we make it digital. So instead of going to our brick and mortar store, we go e-commerce instead of doing a signature on a paper, we do an e-signature, so, that, so that's fine. Now, when we go into digitalization, things get hairy because this is when we use the data that's coming out of digital technology um, to create brand new business models. I know Hendrik will talk more about that as we go, so I'll stay out of that for now. But what happens then is that this blurs the definition of trade, um, because when we make a transaction or, <clears throat> or you know, we don't have that exchange of payment at the same time. So here, for example, we pay for the service of our Facebook account um, while we, because we generate data uh, in return, um, while we're just busy going about our, our every day. So for those of us, for example, who are wearing a smartwatch, Every breath, every pulse is a transaction. So that makes it sort of uh, pretty difficult to, um, to, to define it as digital trade because it is influencing every part of trade as we know it, but it's also now underpinning pretty much everything in our society. 
And uh, that makes it sort of difficult, right? Um, because that means that policymakers will learn how to dance with a whole new set of uh, other people, you know, because we're moving into domestic regulation, we're talking national security, we're talking competition, we, and we're out of our depth um, technology-wise. So we're really gonna have to step up our game, go wider, and we're gonna have to do it quickly. <clears throat> and that's where I see, uh, you know, the DIPA as such an interesting uh, initiative and hopeful and exciting. And I know we'll loop back into that later, so I'll leave that for now. We'll come back to that in a little yeah. while. So th <laughs> thanks for the, this uh, introduction. When we trade normal goods in a digital way, there was this hype that you and I started to talk about several years ago on blockchains. And there was a big sort of feeling that, that this is the new uh, thing. Uh, and, and, and many uh, si signed up to this. And I went to several seminars and I spoke to several companies and they were really hyped into this. But that trend seems to have died out a little bit. Why is that so? Or, or am I, do I have the wrong perception? Uh, no, I think, I think we, you are right. Uh, well, both. The question, you know, the way I like to think about it is, is blockchain uh, remember back in like the 80s, so this is what I said on Twitter that I would talk about. So uh, back in the 80s, only Arnold Schwarzenegger went to the gym, right? So he was the only one, the, <laughs> the bodybuilders were the only one who went to the gym. Uh, and they also induced sort of this interesting um, fashion scene. So there were the mullet and the acid washed jeans. Remember, not stone washed, but acid washed, right? So this was a trend. So we don't see a lot of the mullets anymore, right? And we don't see a lot of acid wash, but we have gyms on every corner and pretty much everyone we know go to a gym now. Not that they look like Schwarzenegger, but there seems to be something going on, right? And so that is the question. So first, I'm just gonna take you back for a second and just explain really quickly what blockchain is and what it isn't, just to get a refresher, right? <clears throat> so blockchain or distributed, Ledger Technologies, DLT. So blockchain is sort of Q-tip, um, the brand, uh, and but it's really a distributed ledger technology. Uh, decentralized um, uh, uh, technology, there we go. Uh, and so what they are done, they're the underlying technology behind Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, and also now the new fad, the DLTs. Uh, which are, you know, I'm not going to organize any discussion on that. That's way beyond my comprehension. Uh, <clears throat> but what it is, is a new way. It was developed to enable two parties that didn't necessarily know or trust each other to make a transaction in Bitcoin uh, without having to use a costly or slow middleman, such as a bank. Uh, and the trade chain is made up of myriads of those sort of transactions. So for trade reasons, they're actually a very, very good invention. Um, it is designed to be trustless, which means that you take the trust out of it, uh, which means that you don't have to trust the person that you meet and, and transact with, because that person doesn't is not the only one who's holding the information. So it's distributed to many. Uh, and also what's gonna happen once you fulfill your requirements is not up to the other hand, but it's actually written into the code. So it takes the trust out of this. Um, so the question is then, what can it do for trade and will it do it? So it's, it's sort of the third phase of a private sector invention that really can revolutionize trade. Uh, and the first part was the container, which by you know some estimates, lowered the cost of transportation by up to 90%. And then we had the ICT revolution, which lowered the cost of communication. And the thrill that is in blockchain is that it, lower, it stands to lower the cost of information. And that's not something that we think about every day, but it's really a huge cost. So if you're shipping a container from Mombasa to um, Rotterdam, um, Emmanuel Gam said in a recent video that that will put 
25 centimeters of paperwork. Uh, it's also uh, estimated to cost the cost of information to go from Mombasa to um, Rotterdam is three times the transportation cost. So the question is, you know, so there's a huge um, potential in there. And, and there's a lot of projects going on and there's a lot of pilots going on. And whether or not it is the gym or the acid wash genes stands to be seen. But as Henrik will probably tell us later, there are a lot of projects going on and how and how much it actually stands to do on the trade scene is to be seen. There's a huge potential that's still untapped and blockchain is actually making a huge headway too. So it might also be that we just don't, aren't hearing about it as much. Um, and I can talk about, talk about the details about what we can do with it later. But um, just to point to the gym at the corner is that now there's a big discussion in Silicon Valley on web 3.0. So the first was the World Wide Web, where we called up, right? And then we have the internet now with all the apps. And people are now saying that the next version of the, of, of the internet will be built on blockchains. And so technologies usually go through this phase, which is, you know, where you don't really see it, but there's a lot of change going on. And my hope and my thoughts is that, that we're, that's where we're at. Wow, from Mombasa to Arnold Schwarzenegger's gym via digital. That's quite a journey. <laughs> that, 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 thanks for that. We'll, we'll come back to this because I understand there's also, I mean, for this to really work, you need common standards, you need interoperability, and the world is not quite there yet. Um, Henrik, you, you have done work with some companies on, on blockchains, and I understand they are mixed experiences uh, and that there are also other ways, of course, to digitalize logistics and to boost trade. I read an article you just wrote for World Economic Forum on what you call the five logistics internet. Um, tell us more about this. Yeah, and, and happy to do that. And also just to, to, uh, to comment on Hannah's uh, point is that, I mean, what I'm telling here is not going to be. Uh, this is where we're going to use blockchain. I mean, the use of the technology really depends on your on your business model, uh, and there is three different business models. We can discuss that afterwards. Where it's either centralized, it's a distributed, or decentralized, and it's only decentralized part where 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 blockchain makes some sense. Um, so actually, the uh, the study you mentioned, Hannah, uh, it, it was. Uh, what I was uh, responsible for in, in, when, when I was with Maersk and created Tradelands. So I was actually sitting in the, uh, uh, following the container uh, together with, with, with our PhD student, uh, Thomas Jensen. Um, uh, uh, and it, it was an amazing experience, right? So, but, but let us uh, go back to the five logistic internets. And Jessica, can you put up the slides? Thank you very much. So um, back in the zeros, I did write a book, uh, Integration as Competitive Advantages, which focused on how important it is for business to focus outwards towards digitally optimizing the business ecosystem they're part of. I usually say that the next wave of digital innovation comes from optimizing the business ecosystem. And this is what I'm gonna uh, talk about today uh, with the global trade as the business ecosystem. Next slide, please. But this means that that, that, that companies has three focuses uh, for data set optimization. The internal optimization, where you ensure your, your internal processes are data set supported, this is what we've been done for, for decades. External optimization, where you easily connect data set with your media business partners, um, it's the APIs, it's the EDIs, et cetera. And then something that is fairly new, uh, the ecosystem optimization, where you actually is focusing on optimizing the full ecosystem you are part of. And global trade absolutely is characterized as requiring a full ecosystem to work together seamlessly. It's not enough just the one-to-one -one connection that happens in internal optimization. It is the full ecosystem that works together. But therefore, it's also surprising, and this is also what you talked about, Cecilia, that we see how few initiatives actually have been taken to digitally optimize the global trade ecosystem. We did discuss before we, um, we started that, that the technology is actually already there. It's just a decision that is, made, uh, that, that is missing. Um, most optimizations we see are focused on specific uh, internal and external optimizations, 
not how how those further down the value chain could benefit from the digitization that you're, you're doing. So today, business ecosystem optimization is typically done by the emergence of digital platforms. Can you take the next slide, please? So digital platforms uh, are creating new revenue sources and disrupting industries, as we've seen, right? It's severely draining the profit and the revenues of the incumbent companies. The illustration here to the left uh, is from Tom, Tom Goodwin's observation, where he sees that the world's largest taxi firm, Uber, owns no cars. The world's most popular media company, Facebook, creates no content. The most valuable retailer, Alibaba, carries no stock. The largest uh, accommodation provider, Airbnb, owes no property, right? And, and, and this is interesting because this is what is happening in any industry. And his uh, primary point is that companies that control the interface between the consumer and the provider of the goods or services are in an incredible value position. They carry none of the cost of providing the service, but take a cost from the millions of consumers that buy from them. So the conclusion is the, um, the interface, this is where the profit is. And therefore you can, of course, also ask yourself why you see so many industries uh, including global trade, especially, uh, are called unprepared for this uh, massive potential for disruption and disruption that Delta Platform offers. Although they have seen how Delta Platform changed the way value is created and reinvented the business models in all industries. Next slide, please. So, is any industry safe from the attack? I mean, the best platform will control the industry. And within a few years, many industries will have a new set of market leaders that use the digital platform model to achieve this position. This can also include the, uh, the, the incumbents in the, in, in the global trade, which means that they will be drained the profits and revenues of these incumbent companies. So to mitigate this, the incumbents in global trade must find ways to work together to control the digitization of the global trade e ecosystem if they want to avoid a digital platform to become the new industry leader, monopolizing the digital interactions within global trade. Next slide, please. As you mentioned, Cecilia, I did write an article for the World Economic Forum Agenda, where, we, where I was highlighting that the most effective path to the digitization is global trade uh, is for the incumbents to collaborate to realize the file logistic internet. It's going to lead to sustain, substantial business benefit for the incumbents. It will in, uh, increase global trade. It will have trade related efficiencies and it's going to reduce cost. So just to say, you know, logistic internet is really an extension of the current internet with foundational logistics, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> logistic specific features. It is commercially, it's politically and competitive neutral, similar to what we see in the internet today. Um, and the purpose is really to replace the current one-to-one -one connection with an internet-like paradigm of connecting once and then sharing with everyone everywhere and do that in a trustworthy and, and, and uh, trustworthy way. So I tried to illustrate the five logistics internets and it just very quickly glance, uh, go over through it. I mean, the global trade identity is also based on a white paper I wrote for World Economic Forum. Um, Basically, uh, the identity and trust lie at the core of, of, of each um, trade interaction. A shared digital global trade identity and a digital signature, which is also important for business and governments, is going to be a foundation component in digital business ecosystem. It's going to remove barriers to digital cross-border interoperability, and it's going to eliminate a significant cost of managing the multiple uh, uh, digital entities that is in place in day today. A digital identity and signature is therefore essential. It ensures you know who you are interacting with and the trade, trade documents you sign digitally cannot be tampered with. If you look at the, the one I call the shared visibility, uh, the purpose there is really to give everyone in the ecosystem access to the necessary logistic information to make uh, decisions to the benefit of the entire ecosystem. That is the whole background from the from the innovation uh, for the trade lens innovation I did with Merck and IBM uh, uh, four or five years ago. If I skip to the financial flow uh, one, this is really about uh, that, that that handling financial flow in global trade is costly. 
there are several intermediaries. I mean, there could be five, 10, 20 intermediaries between the actual payer and the receiver. And that requires a lot of paper and long processing time. And for example, as Hannes mentioned, we at least we have seen that the blockchain can 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 um, transfer uh, uh, even big amounts of money to very low cost. But there needs to be some kind of uh, uh, more efficient way to uh, to handle the financial flow. <laughs> and then the what I call the customs cross border interoperability. I mean, what we have seen with the single windows implementers, they have they understand that a single point of data submission at the national level. It only partially meets the requirements of an international supply chain. Having a, a shared infrastructure uh, would allow any permits, license certificates to be shared digital with any customs or sold around the world. So therefore, it's, it, it is a necess necessary step, a foundational step toward eliminating paper documents of global trade. And it's going to uh, uh, facilitate digital interoperability of government to government interactions on a global scale. Next slide, please. So just to uh, sum up, I mean, realizing the such file logistic internet is going to increase the global trade transport market. It's going to reduce administrative costs for shippers and customs, and including going to increase the wealth, especially in developing countries. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you very much for this. What, one of the problems with blockchains, and I touched upon it, and I think you mentioned it, uh, Hannah, is of course that that you need standards, you need interoperability, you need so so that they can cooperate with each other. But this is a problem also for your solutions, right? Do we have these common standards? Is it interoperability th at the same way so that it would be easier or, or better than, than uh, blockchains? Because it has the same assets. I mean, it, it is safe, it, it is uh, uh, shared. Um, shared information it cannot be tampered with etc or is it just a matter of political will or policy decisions from the companies but in in, in many cases it really is a matter of of, of making decisions and i know it, it, mm -hmm. it sounds easy because it's i mean it, it's a whole world that needs to make decisions right maybe we're going to hear about what, what what you're doing in new zealand uh, singapore and chile etc which is a, a step on the on the way and there's also some other by, by bilateral initiatives um, but, but um, so, so first of all, I mean, I mean, also just remember, blockchain is just a very underlying technology. It is just as interesting as all about the, t the technology that powers the internet, right? Uh, uh, the interesting thing with the internet is the home pages, and the same thing is whether you're using blockchain or anything else is, of course, what you what, what you put on top of it, right? So, so, uh, so. Uh, and 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 definitely also uh, uh, it's also certain that 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 we are not certain that, that that blockchain is actually going to be used for for any of this one here. Maybe it's going to be used for one of it, but 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 the important thing when you talk about blockchain is, as I mentioned before, it is if you do have a decentralized business uh, uh, business model, and and I think Hannah also mentioned that the important the decentralized business model means that you don't have a trusted third party. I mean, you don't have a digital mm -hmm. platform. You don't have an Airbnb uh, <laughs> in there. Uh, <coughs> So, uh, and, and instead of having a company that you rely on, you, you, you have the, uh, the code instead. But that gives a lot of other challenges on the governance and who is actually having the, the, the benefit from it. Uh, who, who is gonna finance the whole developing of, of, of a blockchain solution? So, mm. so, so, so one thing is, yeah, blockchain is there and maybe, maybe not, it, it, it works, but it's not really that interesting uh, because it, it really is an underlying technology. Then you can ask, uh, uh, do, do the other uh, uh, components, are they already standardized? And no, not yet, but a lot of work has been done for the global trade identity. Uh, I mean, there is the sovereign network, there is uh, um, uh, the G-Live, which is the financial, uh, we have uh, uh, sectors, way to identify. We have the uh, uh, um, authorized economic operators in, 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 in the UK, the, uh, Etc. In the U.S., so there is some standards, but 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 there we probably more need to have a common digital standard, and especially also digital signature, because we do not have a digital signature mm. yet that is all uh, that, that is recognized. Um, mm. And then there's the other one. You can also argue that the uh, uh, the trade document, whether it's a certificate uh, um, uh, or any kind of other trade document, it is fairly standardized in global trade. 
yeah, we, we maybe not have the exact digital representation, uh, but it is fairly standardized. So it really is, me, to me, to really digitize global trade, it really is a question of making decisions from the incumbent uh, uh, in the industry to actually uh, realize these uh, uh, backbones or infrastructures. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, Hannah, I can see you, you, you're waving. Do you want to comment or a question to, to oh, yeah, 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 yeah. come to Alison? Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, I, I think Kendrick makes a, an important point, and I think we have... Um, there is a part there there is that is missing so one thing is just like as i was talking about digitization right so it's about using blockchain as a means to ease the bottlenecks that we know that we have in the process so we know that a trade financing is hard and we know um that you know it's hard to be an sme uh, and do all these trade things because there's a lot of risks and trust involved right so so that's one one thing of it but the promise that blockchain holds and the thing that makes me really excited about it is what we can do with that extra information. Um, because once we, since information, we now we don't know what we're missing. So if you go into the store and you're to, to buy um, some sort of gym equipment because you want a home gym, uh, then maybe you you will know this this soccer ball. There will be two, right? Um, and so one will be made out of the only thing that's basically different. They're like leather, and they're different in price. But you don't have a lot of more information to go on because that information has been lost. And so this information is something that the consumer doesn't even know. So it doesn't enter their conscious stream of consciousness as they're making the decision. They don't. So, but if one says this one is made without child labor, that makes you stop and think, right? Because then you're like, hey, I don't want the one. Is the other one made out of child labor? Mm -hmm. Then that's not what I want. And so I think that there's two things. So the one is that consumers can make a lot better choices. So Carrefour, the French retailer, mm. for example, you can go into their store with a smartphone and you can um, click on a, a QR sticker and you can find out about a piece of chicken. Everything, I mean everything, who, where it grew up, when it was slaughtered, if it was given antibiotics, um, you know, it hasn't been kept cold and so on, everything. And all of a sudden, you know, we start seeing that we don't have that information. So there's an information asymmetry that also leads mm. to darkness, right? Because information is so costly. Uh, so for consumers, I think that's a huge thing, but there's a learning curve there. We need to know what we don't know. And the same is true for trade policy. So for example, with the GSPs, it's a really good way of looking into the policy decisions that you've made. Um, and so in order to implement them and make sure that they're followed. So, you know, for the GSPs, for example, if you have problems with labor rights, you can't do anything about that as a policymaker now until it's a national problem. And then you will have to cut the whole na nation out of it. But this way you can do it firm level. Um, so there's there's a big incentive there, I think, for the government to go in and make sure that this learning process takes place for themselves, but also for consumers, and, and to that way empower like SMEs, for example. Mm. And that could lead to uh, a lot of important information. I mean, not right now we have discussions on, on due diligence, on, on uh, you mentioned child labor, but there are also the whole ecological footprint uh, and animal welfare things that are important for consumers and citizens all over the world. And of course, you can put um, legislation affecting uh, companies, but you could also on a more individual basis, put this information into that QR code via this technology, which is of course promoting fair trade uh, in a way that that is quite uh, revolutionary. Exactly, exactly. Chinese, uh, you know, cotton. Um, mm, for instance, um, this is, fascinating but it can be a little bit technical uh, uh, as well because after all it is about policymakers trying to facilitate rules you have mentioned all e-contracts e-signatures there's also a way how you deal with spam um, how you address these border uh, data flows market access and, and there's a lot of, of uh, initiatives going on around the world to try to have international uh, agreements on this. I was in Buenos Aires at the uh, WTO Ministerial in 2017, where almost 90 countries signed an initiative 
to try to negotiate different ways to boost e-commerce or digital trade. And those negotiations are on their way. They have made progress, but in some cases, uh, they're slow. But some countries have gone even further. And in June 2020, if I'm correct, there was a deal signed between New Zealand, Chile and Singapore called the DIPA, Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, where you try to address all these issues. And Alison, you were one of the negotiators from, from New Zealand uh, and, and, and that team, and it's now up and running. Uh, so please tell us, how does it work in practice? What has been the, the benefits? Where, where do you go from there? Well, kia ora tato. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Ko Alison Hamilton aho. My name is Alison Hamilton, and I speak to you today from Geneva, but um, in the role before I came to Geneva, I was serving as New Zealand's lead negotiator for the DEPA. So I think my my role or, or my, my intent in this conversation is tr to try to share some of the trade policy experience that we um, that we have in trying to grapple with the changing trade environment and particularly to focus focus on the deeper and I hope to come away with some ideas and inspiration which I already have from my co-panelists um, about bringing some real world back in to the trade policy so as you mentioned the the deeper is New Zealand's first trade agreement to focus solely on digital issues we launched negotiations in May 2019 in the margins of APEC, and it was signed virtually in June 2020. So in trade negotiation land, um, that's very quick. Uh, it's a really fast negotiation, but I know that in the real world of people doing business, that still seems painfully slow and behind the times. But um, for us in, in trade policy world, it, it was a fast negotiation. And reflecting on, on the speed that we tried to work, um, I think it's worth to highlight some of the context that fed into those negotiations and discussions. So first, the international rules-based system was changing. It still is. Then COVID-19 started to generate uncertainty for the trading environment. It still is. And the nature of trade itself was changing, and it still is. And Henrik's focus just now on the global trade ecosystem and the role of platforms, I think, really demonstrates that last point very starkly. So with, this, with that context in mind, there were sort of three overriding objectives feeding into the trade policy action or the trade policy idea sitting behind DEPA. First is to be a protector against protectionism. Um, there's an increasing global protectionism trend, ongoing assault to the rules that underpin our trading system, and the DEPA is an attempt to demonstrate continued value in looking outwards and working together. Second, it was designed to be a safety net for those rules and the rules-based system that's at risk. Um, the WTO dispute settlement system under threat or more, and new rules on digital trade that you mentioned around uh, e-commerce among a subset of, of WTO members, they take a long time to develop. So the deeper was a chance and an opportunity for us to move more quickly. And third objective, um, and it's worth being frank on it, is an instrument to protect New Zealand's interest. Um, we're a small, distant player. Our exports face tariff and non-tariff barriers that increase the cost of doing business. And the DEPA is, is designed to try to help reduce those non-tariff and other trade-related transaction costs. So to try and attempt to deal with the bottlenecks that, that have been talked about and to try to facilitate trade. So, so with, that, with that context, with those objectives, the DEPA attempts to cover all aspects of the digital economy that might support trade in a digital era from business and trade facilitation through to the wider trust environment, issues like digital inclusion. And in that way is designed to be a more ambitious coverage than what you might find in a traditional free trade agreement or in, in the WTO based conversations on, on e-commerce. I really appreciate the comment you made earlier, Hannah, that the definitions are you didn't you didn't say fluid, but you know there are different aspects or different ways you could design or de define digital trade. This was something we really grappled with as negotiators. What what is the scope of what we're trying to deal with here? You could look at it very narrowly through a purely digital products lens, or you could look at it in a extremely broad context and look at it through the entire digital ecosystem. Um, 
it's not called a digital trade partnership agreement. It's called the digital economy partnership agreement. We we deliberately tried to go to go wider, um, covering issues like digital identity that Henrik was talking about, like consumer trust, trying to be a little bit beyond what what was already covered. But up front, it scrapes the surface about what it could go into. So it's it's really an attempt to identify areas where currently three partners, Chile, New Zealand and Singapore, will be able to work together under the DEPA as, as a living agreement. Um, perhaps we'll get together to try to make some of the decisions that Henrik is asking us, asking us to make at the policy maker level. Um, the fact that it's designed as a living agreement means that it is it's meant to be updated, it's meant to evolve, and it's meant to respond to the changing nature of the environment. And as policymakers, we we know as much as what our businesses tell us. We know as much as what our stakeholders tell us are problems and issues that they would like us to try to face. Um, so we we need to do that in conversation. It's not something we can we can do on our on our own. A living agreement for the deeper means that it can change both in membership and substance. Um, so with respect to membership, consistent with New Zealand's approach to plurilaterals or agreements or outcomes with a subset of WTO members, something less than the full membership. Um, it's designed to support plurilaterals in support of the multilateral system and therefore is open to WTO members who can meet its standards and consistent with our view that the digital economy will change. Um, so to the partnership, people who are, or governments who are part of the partnership could change. So to this, the subject matter that is under discussion or up, up, up for grabs. So the DEPA is a vehicle essentially to discuss these issues and to speak with our like-minded small countries at this stage on the issues that we face in the global digital trading environment. It doesn't necessarily set the rules, the regulations, the standards for interoperability that, that we hear about. It doesn't, it doesn't go that far at this point in time, but it provides an avenue for us to talk to our partners about what those rules could, should be. And I think fundamentally, it provides an opportunity for policymakers to look outward rather than inward first. So as you face an issue from a domestic policy setting, something that comes up in your domestic environment, as we saw in, in the context and, and the objectives for what the deal is, there's a there's a growing tendency to look in and think, what is what is the best way to design this purely from my domestic perspective? And the deeper really acknowledges that there is value and benefit in looking outward and having that conversation with our partners um, and, and to look outward as part of that domestic policy conversation. So the agreement was an important step, just a step, and the challenge is now for our implementers to try to bring it to life. And their job, I have to say, is much harder than mine as a negotiator. I mean, I, I just get, get to write, write the write the agreement, negotiate the agreement, and then have the have the fun of the signing ceremony. They have to do the real work and they have to they have to bring life to it and and bring a a real world real real world perspective to the cooperation and to the rules that we try to um, advance through the deeper. So, so their efforts are, are instrumental to making making it work. And part of um, part of what that involves means talking to talking to our traders and talking to our business who would actually benefit from increased cooperation. So, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. I'll leave it leave it there, but more than happy to to keep keep talking. Thank you so much. Uh, I think this is really exciting and I understand that. I mean, it's it, it's a moving target uh, in a way and, and it, it's a living agreement. So so that means, and, and it's very new as well, so you can't really evaluate it yet. But from what I've heard, both Canada and South Korea has expressed uh, quite uh, serious interest in, in joining. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, of course, a sign that, that you know, they think you, you got it right. Do you think this is a way to sort of move forward more concretely on the global 
term. I'm, I'm thinking about the e-digital, uh, e-trade, uh, e-commerce agreement within the WTO, which is also touching upon, you know, paperless trade, cross-border data flow, personal data protection, uh, digital identities, as you also, but you try to make it much more, more concrete. Can this be a way to sort of show the way to facilitate those negotiations? Or is it more of a competitor among like-minded that, that <laughs> those who think it's going too slow, they will join you instead? Or can they, can they co-live, so to say? I think probably a, a little bit of both. So we know that negotiations in Geneva take a long time. And we know that negotiations in Geneva, um, experiencing it firsthand, um, are complicated because <laughs> they involve a, a much larger group of members with a, with a much, much larger group of interests and domestic settings that they come from, which, to be fair, is part of the real glory of Geneva and mm. part of the real benefit of a multilateral outcome in that it does bring together 164 members and is always going to be the first best option in terms of setting trade policy. Um, if you're going to have rules, then multilateral rules, I mean, they're, they're the best ones to get. Um, it brings everyone together, common standards, mm. common rules. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I probably don't need to espouse the benefits of multilateralism. But in the context of, of challenges to that system and in the context of the timeframes that it can take to get to outcomes, alongside the ever-changing reality and the fact that trade is just changing without trade policy makers coming along for the ride, um, the deeper is designed to go faster um, and mm. to get to, you know, to get things done, to try and to try and be out there and, and demonstrate what's possible. So, so yes, it's designed to to demonstrate what what can be done, what rules can be designed, and we hope to then reinforce those mm. bigger conversations. And that could be in the form of um, just a gold standard that people look to and think that's a good target to aim for. Let's try and get along the way. Or it could be in the form of expanding membership that grows over time, that the club gets bigger. Mm. Um, or it could be in the case of copy paste deals, you know, people who think this is a good idea. I'd, I'd like to do that with my close partners as well. Yeah. Well, that's good. I think uh, many actors around the world are looking at this to, to see how it's going and, and to expect the first sort of evaluations and also the results when it comes to business. We, we let the audience in in a little while. I just wanted to, to ask Hannah and, and Henrik, you've heard now uh, Alison uh, talking about the negotiations and about this agreement. Is this something that you think fits into what you talked about, the, the need to have some common policy and, and standards and, and policymakers also facilitating for big and small companies uh, to actually do the, the, I mean, they don't do the trade. Uh, the companies do the trade, but, but you need certain rules and frameworks. Uh, and that's the, very much the aim of, of, of the DEPA, of course. Absolutely, uh, uh, deeper, uh, and also with the description I, I've, I've been reading on, 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 on the internet, it sounds definitely as a step in the right direction. But I also need to understand, uh, <coughs> Alison, I mean, how much are you actually going to implement in, in uh, one thing is legally fine, right? But, 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 but to do things digitally, you actually need to build some kind of, of underlying uh, backbone or, yeah, I call them logistic internets. Uh, Mean, 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 how far are you in that, or what is the plans? We, we actually realize a, a backbone that is that, that's going to facilitate global trade. Um, and if you do, obviously, need to make sure that there can be more than you, uh, the three of you on there, right? But uh, yeah, that's right. It, it needs to be more than three if it really is going to be a global ecosystem, yeah, yeah. A, global, a global backbone. And it needs to be more than three small economies who have got a particular. Um, yeah. interest in, in this world so it's at a nascent stage you know this is mm. something that that's, that's growing from a policy perspective and it's something that's growing and being thought through from a domestic perspective and an international perspective contemporaneously which yeah. raises challenges for us as policymakers because often yeah. we have a domestic policy context that we then take out to the world and we try to mm. <laughs> convince or or negotiate with people to convince them our way is the best way yeah. In but, the but, digital but it, space, yeah. we're doing both at the same time. 
Okay, but 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 are they ambitious about actually implementing some of the uh, of the stock? So we actually have a digital to support of the digital identity of the paperless trade of the uh, 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 yeah, what else did you have on on on, on there? Yeah, but, but 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 several other parts, right? So so, yes, so it is ambitious to actually to do some kind of digital implementation of that. Certainly. Okay. Hannah, did you have a comment? And then I'll turn to the yeah. Q&A. Yes, I think that, um, you know, really handing it to Singapore and New Zealand and Chile and Singapore took the initiative here for this uh, agreement. I think it's extraordinarily valuable. I think that whatever they're doing, you know, the e-commerce discussions that are going on at the WTO are very important. Uh, but as I said in my opening statement, there's so much more going on um, that cannot be handled within you know, just the world of trade as we know it. So just having this forum where where these countries are committed to have this conversation and because that's obvious that there's no way, there's no place to have these conversations is just incredibly, incredibly big. And it has prompted others to take that second step, right? So even China, I've seen, ha has uh, an interest in joining. And so Canada and China and, Ch and um, Korea. And in December, you know, the EU, who Cecilia herself has had been navel gazing and have been stuck on, uh, you know, the GDPR and not negotiating anything regarding data flows, have now started conversations with Singapore about having a DEPA of their own. So it's mm. really fundamental in, in putting in momentum and providing, uh, you know, a forum, which I think is amazing. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there, there are lots of questions here. We'll take uh, a few uh, and see how many we can add. First, there are two concerning uh, blockchains. There is a perception that blockchain and digital trade can be exploited by large firms and monopolies to create information asymmetry, to exploit data of consumers to create further profits while delivering low quality services. And related to this, I think it's by the same Mr. Greg Smith, is digital trade in blockchain going to create conflicts with multiple uh, multilateral organizations like WTO or with regulators like central banks or capital markets regulators. Maybe this is something for Hannah or, or Henrik to answer. I think Henrik has the details uh, that I wouldn't want to step into, but I would like to see that there is, for example, the, so a trade lens was uh, uh, that uh, Henrik has worked on was developed by the IBM, but in conjunction with Hyperledger which is an open source organization, right? So mm -hmm. even IBM, who's been making all their money uh, on patents, are realizing that this is moving too quickly for them. So there's definitely other players out there um, that, that can take a step. And secondly, I also think that it's important to see that the big organizations such as ISO are working on standards for blockchain. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything but to go add, ahead, Henrik? Yeah, can I, can I just have a comment just, just in general on blockchain? Mm -hmm. I did mention in the beginning is that, 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 that the choice of technology obviously depends on what is your business model. It, it's like anything, right? It, it, and blockchain doesn't change that. I mean, it seems like for, for whatever reason, uh, uh, many are saying we need to use blockchain and then we need to find a problem to solve, uh, which is obvious not, not, not the right way to do it, right? And as I mentioned, when you look at an uh, at, at, at ecosystem, uh, digitization. I mean, there's three options. There's a, there's a centralized part. I mean, if the ecosystem can agree about a, a centralized, a, a third trusted party, and this is the Airbnb, etc. It could also be the WTO. It could be EU. It could be the, uh, the uh, uh, initiatives in, in in New Zealand. I mean, if you actually can agree on a trusted third party, where you actually can store the data. Uh, then it works great with centralized technology and it's a lot easier because it's well-proven technology. This is how we built IT for many years, right? Then there is the uh, distributed part, which is again, uh, because one of the challenges with the, uh, with, with the centralized part is that you give us a lot of power to this uh, uh, trusted third party. So uh, if, you, if you want to avoid that, then you want each of the uh, uh, participant to control their own data uh, and then the infrastructure is going to be thin. It's just make sure the transaction is going to happen. Um, but this, uh, uh, um, but, but the important thing is that in, in those cases, you keep control of the data and of your transactions. Mm -hmm. 
the last point is decentralized. This is where there is, where, where if, if you cannot agree on a, on, on, on a, uh, on a centralized uh, uh, part to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to be the trusted third party, you can put it on the, uh, on the blockchain and the, the, the codes uh, uh, handle the, uh, uh, the trust. Uh, but the challenge there is definitely the whole governance, right? Because, because I mean, I mean, who is actually going to govern how, how that trust is implemented? If you really want to have that decentralized, and this is the big challenge with blockchain is about how do you actually do whole, the, 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 whole, uh, the whole governance of this one here? I mean, I did, uh, just to take an example, uh, I did do a, a, a work for in Argentina where I had to look at, at, at um, a blockchain for trade signal windows in Argentina. And my recommendation was not to use it because you will then disintermediate the customs and you don't want to do that, right? Traditionally, it's custom run the trade signal windows. But where I was suggesting to use blockchain was uh, 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 as, as, as the underlying layer for exchanging documents between customs. I mean, this is what I call the uh, um, uh, yeah, the paper is traders, so you also call it the Dallas, and because there, there is no necessary, uh, no no obvious trust of third party. Maybe that makes uh, <laughs> makes sense. Uh, to have it uh, uh, to to have it as a uh, as the underlying vehicle to make sure do uh, documents move from one custom to another customs uh, in a trustworthy way. Did that make sense, mm. Cecilia? Okay. Yeah, I mean it, it is complicated, but 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 it, 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 I'm trying to make sense out of this, and I, I hope that our listeners as well. We get a lot of, of good feedback on on the Q and A. Yes, you will have. Uh, I'll, can I send a few questions with you, Alison, and you can comment on this? And and pardon to my my to the listeners. I'm shortening the questions a little bit. There are several questions on on the DEPA. One, China has expressed interest. Whether their specific approach to to data flows and data protections could at all be compatible. Then there's one whether DEPA could enter the uh, you know OECD, whether it could be an OECD uh, broaden and deepen, including through institutions such as OECD. And then finally, and then I'll, I'll let you answer, uh, sorry, there is one uh, that there is, um, um, it disappeared, sorry, that there is actually not yet any any um, any binding provisions in the DEPA, of, of course. It's mainly so far looking uh, forward to look at cooperation and potential deliverables. Uh, is there any deliverables that can be mentioned since they enter into force? And were any of the test use cases finalized? Sorry, that's quite a workload for you, for you Alison, but try that's to answer okay. what you can. I will indeed. And I'll first start by commenting on the question before, which was about conflict with um, international organizations like the WTO or, or the World Bank and others. I don't think there's a, a conflict unless we ignore it. So if those of us who are working for governments and members in the WTO and other organizations ignore the business reality and ignore technology changing, then we're at risk of, of generating rules and, and making decisions that, that create conflict. If we are engaging with business, if we're engaging with people who trade, if we're engaging with SMEs and trying to understand the, the real world of doing business, then we will, I hope, fingers crossed, avoid any challenge or conflict. But that in itself is a challenge, right? Because we, we need to be better at doing doing that outreach and talking to people about what, what they actually need from the rules. So that's why I find these conversations so useful and inspiring because you then take them back to, to what we do day to day. So with that, the, the questions on DEPA, in terms of expansion um, and specific, specific um, countries or WTO members who have expressed an interest, um, yes, there is a, there are a range of members. Um, Cecilia, you've mentioned some, China is one as well. In short, the WTO, sorry, the DEPA is open to WTO members who can meet its standard. The critical piece there is who can meet its standard. And I won't cast judgment on how that would play out in particular particular members or particular negotiations, but it is an important part of the conversation. And we would want to ensure that in any accession process to any agreement, um, we're doing it with, with partners who are fully committed to the full context of, of what the agreement looks like. The question about um, institutions like the OECD, that's a really interesting one. It's not something that I have thought about 
specifically, but in short, yes, why not? Um, it's a great institution and it's a group of members or group of countries who are really looking and focused on digital trade solutions and why not? Um, I'm up for that if, if people are wanting to talk about it. And then in terms of the, the real world experience or you know deliverables of, of the deeper, one of the, I think most um, probably boring, but also exciting examples of something that could work really well as a deliverable under deeper is on e-invoicing, where we're trying really hard to bring um, the e-invoicing to real life so that um, we can take out the time frame between an invoice and payment and if we can make that work under deeper i think that would be the one of the one of the strongest deliverables it's something we're working on in in other contexts and um it's not a it's not a deliverable i can't say yes it's working and it's great and it's you know deeper has delivered it but i think it's a one of those sort of boring trade issues that if we can get it right would be a great a great deliverable indeed but i don't I think it's boring at all <laughs> and I think it really, this is really something that especially is important for small companies, of course, exactly. if they, you can shorten the administrative time and facilitate. So, so it's not boring at all. Unfortunately, the clock is ticking and we, we don't have much time. We could discuss this for a very long time. I think we've only scrapped a little bit on the surface of the gigantic area, of course. But I want to thank my wonderful panel, Hannah, Henrik, Alison. Thank you so much for your contributions. I have certainly learned a lot. Uh, and I see from the comments field that, that um, the, many people in the audience have appreciated uh, as well this discussion. So thank you so much to all of you who have been listening and to you as well. Uh, next month, we will talk about a very interesting acronym called CIBA, which means Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, and it's much more interesting than you think it is. Uh, so tune in, uh, in in a month as well. And thank you so much, and hopefully see you then. Thank you so much.